Good day, Marco. How are you going today? I'm good. I'm good. How are you, Peter? It's I'm nice good. to see I'm you. Good. Again. Now, for those of you that don't know this, Marco is one of the co-founders of Odyssey Catamarans, and he's also a naval architect in his own right. And he's come along today, and he's going to go through the design features of the Odyssey 48, which, in my opinion, is going to be one of the best performing catamarans out there. So, look, just take it away, Marco. Just let's go through okay. it. Okay. I think uh, we should start talking about the hydrodynamic super hull. Okay. Uh, because that's a, that's a major point um, that uh, uh, people have been commenting in the past. And, uh, uh, you know, we have been back and forth. Uh, you are were asking me questions. I was trying to give you answers. So I think it's, it's good that we can... Uh, uh, explain to the people a little bit about the hydrodynamic hydrodynamics and the hull design. Absolutely. Going with that approach on the 48, that it has a narrow uh, bow, obviously, and a narrow stern, uh, it gives the ability to have best of the world. What, what I mean by this is, uh, because mostly when you have a, a world cruiser tournament, uh, you are focused to be able to have uh, a lot of efficiency in terms of the forces acting on your tail, in terms of drag in the water and speed. And you turn, you want to have the efficiency in, uh, in lower speeds, in lower uh, winds in order to be more specific. It is true that there are some places on the planet where the winds are great. Here is some good wind, although even this captain is praying for more. Sometimes it is a tad strong and these times can be the most exhilarating, but quite often the winds are light. The big advantage of a light and efficient performance catamaran is you will still be sailing and doing good sea miles when the majority of other boats will be bobbing or motoring. This is so important for cruising, you will cover many more sea miles, cutting your travel time dramatically and reducing your exposure to potential storms that may clobber you. I think we are in a very good position right now, in a very good spot with the design that we have. And it proved to us through calculations and studies that it can actually be very efficient, these kind of speeds. So that's why we choose to go with that uh, narrow uh, end of the sugar scoop, because it uh, reduces the drag at these kind of speeds. I think yeah, it's something that will... um, is neglected, though, from people, isn't it? That um, the, the reattachment of the water at the end of the boat is neglected. Exactly. And if you've exactly. got lots of eddies and rough water, that exactly. energy has to come from somewhere. And it comes from yeah. the speed of your boat. Exactly. Look how smooth the wake is here. The calmer your wake, the faster your boat will go. This is a reasonably efficient catamaran with narrow bows and a moderately sized sugar scoop. The Odyssey will be even more streamlined and efficient than this boat here, and coupled with the fact that it is made of aluminium and very light and strong, the Odyssey is going to be a killer, especially in light winds. I think we have best of the both worlds right now, with the setup that we're going and the uh, design of uh, uh, the current hull. Another thing that I would like us to cover is uh, the design of uh, the roof of the superstructure. Uh, because we mentioned in the past, uh, the two of us, that uh, we wanted to uh, change a little bit the design because we wanted to implement more uh, sail area uh, to be able to get even more wind uh, to the sail. So one of the main reasons was to be able to lower the boom compared to the previous design to the, let's say, the version one. And uh, yeah, we managed to do that by um, having uh, one continuous roof now. Um, and you can also see that uh, what we have is an opening to be able to have uh, two different uh, helm positions and, and uh, scale uh, the vessel. Uh, so that gives us um, this kind of design implementation um, gives us better ergonomics when it comes to saving space on the vessel. You know, this is not something new in the market. This has been implemented by other companies, but the truth is that it's uh, it makes the life very easy. It's very ergonomic, and at the same time, uh, saves a lot of 
Pris in a caravan of this size. In each of the hull of the vessel, we have four different uh, water tank compartments. Uh, you can see in the bow that we have a watertight bulkhead separating the uh, shower of the bathroom with the sail locker. But in that area that it's in the front, in the bow, uh, the whole volume space over there is divided by two. And what we have essentially is on the top the sail locker and on the bottom the collision bucket. Uh, you can find another two water tank compartments in the aft of the vessel. The one, it's the engine room, and the other one further aft is considered to be the steering gear room. Now, all of the water tank compartments, they are separated from the top with a watertight hatch that is fully aluminum watertight hatch. No acrylic, no uh, seals with uh, uh, silicone. I think it's fully watertight hatch is welded uh, to the plating. And when you close them, they're fully watertight. That gives you the ability uh, when you are in bad weather conditions, when you're feeling unsafe on the vessel, when you're traveling in bad weather, to fully close everything and feel even more safer that you still have a lot of watertight compartments separating the vessel in case of any flooding, in case of any reefing, in case of any grouting. If something comes under the vessel, if you break something, there's always the safety uh, that you have in mind that your vessel is not going to go in the bottom of the sea. So with the eight watertight compartments that the vessel has, uh, we separate the accommodation area uh, from all the other void spaces, and that gives us the opportunity uh, in case of any flooding to be able to keep the vessel uh, in the waterline. The volume space now that we create with these watertight compartments it's higher than the volume or than the displacement of the vessel in the sea. So what that means, if for any reason the accommodation gets flooded, the vessel is going to stay on the surface. The vessel is going to stay on the surface in a very good point that you're going to save most of the vessel. You're going to save most of the electronics because most of the electronics will not get wet. That is an amazing safety issue. So in effect, if the hull is breached, there is a very good chance you can sail it back to port. I should also point out that it is very hard to breach aluminium in any case, unlike fiberglass. Here you can see collisions can lead to major breaches in fiberglass, which is alarming because most catamarans out there are made from fiberglass. And carbon fiber also has its issues. It tends to shatter under point load. Aluminium, however, tends to ding, bend or crumple, making it unlikely to get a breach, which in itself is a great safety feature. Now, another safety issue that we implement as well is the kick-up rudders. Uh, the kick-up rudders, they play a major role mostly when you want to go and beach the boat when you're going to go in shallow waters, but at the same time, it saves your rudders in case you hit something, in case uh, you're traveling on a, on a lake or a river, there are logs, yeah, the, the water, it's, uh, it's blurry, you cannot see where you're going, you cannot see what is in there. So even though that is mostly a feature for uh, using, uh, for rising the kick-up rudders in order to be able to beach the vessel, uh, they uh, they can save uh, they can save the rudders. Let's go through that again. This is an older design. The rudder hits something. The block of wood breaks. The rudder post and cassette are free to go aft. There are two problems with this. See if you can see them and put it in the comments. We have solved both these problems in the Odyssey 48, but we will show you in a later episode. This. Uh, uh engineering type of mechanism that we implemented. I think it was the fifth or the sixth design that we did with Peter. And uh, we have been, yeah, we have been trying to find the best solution for months, to be honest, before we start uh, finally uh, making it uh, in a 3D and, uh, you know, calculating and animating and see that everything works fine. That was one of the essential elements of the uh, Odyssey 48 that uh, 
both David and I really, really wanted. Because I'm an adventurous type, look, I understand the safety issue. You hit something, they're going to kick up. That's a great idea. That's wonderful. But I like the way that you can just kick them up yourself and you can go wherever you like. You can go across bars, sandbars. You can go to totally isolated reefs with a fringing reef the entire way around and there's no inlet. You can actually go in mid-tide, high-tide, kick up your rudders and you just drive the boat like a tank and you can go to places that no other boat goes to ever. That is a huge plus in my mind. But yes, safety issue, uh, it's also, it's a great thing. The target boards that we implemented on the design of this particular vessel, they may look simple, but we wanted to create target boards that, first of all, are easy to maintain, and that means uh, they made out of materials that can be reconstructed, even if they break, even if they dent. So we decided to make them aluminium. The design is simple. The construction is simple. They have a straight cut that they're not curvy, okay, which makes them ideal to be able to pull them up directly from the deck, if you if you choose to, to be able to maintain them, to be able to clean them to be able to clean the casing inside because the casing, yeah, with the, with the users and the time, yeah, it gets salt, maybe it gets a little bit of greenery of the sea. You never know. So you, you need to be able to completely remove it, easily to remove it. The Odyssey's dagger boards are going to be similar to these, light and very buoyant, with one person being able to lift them out. Or, if not, use a halyard to do it. Marco brings up a very good point. Ease of maintenance is very important. So how do you clean the cassette hole? On my old catamaran, I had a board with a screw-in pole that matched the profile of the hole, and you simply moved it up and down and knocked off the barnacles and growth inside. On the Odyssey, this job would be about 10 or 15 minutes for each dagger board because they are so light and easy to remove. But compare this with crazy fantasy land catamarans with super strong large curved dagger boards flying a hull and racing around the bay and winning the Saturday afternoon trophy. All these manufacturers are silent on maintenance of their dagger boards. I wonder why. I guarantee you it takes three or four people to remove a large dagger board such as these and half a day at least to clean both boards and cassettes and replace the boards. Not an easy job for anyone cruising. And when it isn't an easy job, then it gets done infrequently, which leads to problems. The Odyssey's dagger boards are designed to shear off or bend if they hit an obstacle, protecting the integrity of the hull. Sensible stuff, which is what all catamarans did in the past. But recently, Fantasyland catamarans are creating super strong dagger boards in order to fly a hull. The trouble is, what happens to the hull when one of these massively strong dagger boards hits something solid? I would expect the outcome to be catastrophic. You can see here now the structural members of the vessel in the following photos. I'm just going to mention only the most important one, which is the main keel. You can see that it's running all the way along the length of each of the hulls. And also in the bows, uh, it, it lifts up and turns up 90 degrees and creates something like a, like a cutting blade at the front. So you're wondering why is it there? So first of all, this is a very great, this is a great addition when it comes to uh, the collision bulkhead at the front. Uh, in any case that there is an accident and the boat crashes at the front, even if you hit a marina, another boat, it doesn't matter. It literally acts like, you see these ancient Greek ships, it acts like pursues, like goes through because it has this blade at the front. Uh, it gets all the impact, so all of the tensions, all of the forces instantly coming into the to the hull at that point of contact, they transmit it along the length of the keel, all the length of the keel, which means all the structural members of each of the hull, they carry and they divide the tensions and the forces. Not only that, but when we look at the formulas for the moment of inertia between the round bar on the left and the Odyssey's keel on the right, the strength of the keel alone of the Odyssey is about 150 times the strength of the round bar on the left. This is a very strong backbone.
So when it comes to the CE certification that uh, European Union implements, uh, they have very strict uh, rules and regulations that the companies need to follow in order to make a vessel for production. So that's why we end up with a very stiff and a very strong vessel that can withstand a lot of forces. We reach to a point that the vessel is so stiff and so strong, we manage to keep the weight down and we manage to bring out a vessel that it's lightweight for its size and the stiffness and the performance that uh, that provides. That's something we get away with because aluminium is, I would say, the most ideal boat building material. There is a reason why Jimmy Cornell, a man respected in the sailing industry for 40 plus years, prefers aluminium boats. And then there is Steve Dashu, a sailor and designer for more than 50 years. He also prefers aluminium, and there are a heap of other sailors and designers out there too. You may ask, why don't other boat builders use aluminium? Well, because it's expensive, and boat builders out there are trying to make money. The Odyssey 48, it's going to have two windows at... Uh, the bulkhead that separates the cockpit with the interior salon, two big windows for good ventilation, a big door of 140 in uh, in width, 1.4 meters in width. So th- these opening areas by themselves are going to provide a lot of ventilation of the vessel. And together with the two opening windows at the front of the superstructure, it's going to create a very good a refreshment and a very good breeze coming into the vessel, especially when you're anchored. We also have traditional hatches, uh, aluminum hatches with acrylic paneling in every cabin and in the two bathrooms, in the two uh, heads that we have. Uh, the difference now, uh, and that's, that's what makes the huge difference compared to a fiberglass vessel, is that the aluminum framing of each of the hatch is not going to be just glued and screwed on the deck. It's going to be welded on the deck, which means it's going to be there for life and it's never going to leak and it's never going to twist and it's never going to dis, uh, disform from any kind of weather conditions. I'm more than happy to answer any question that people will have. I'm more than happy to hear uh, to hear feedback from people uh, because we reached to the, to this point that we are right now because we want to hear the feedback. We care about the people that they want to actually use these vessels. Okay, good on you, Marco. Look, thank you very much for your time there. And yes, people, thank if you. you've got any questions, please send them through, and I'll forward them on to Marco. And um, that's probably going to be another episode right there. All right, well, look, top stuff, and um, we'll see you next time.